But again, when you, here's the thing, when you begin to take the word of God and look for these gray areas and you begin to question things like the virgin birth or like the atonement, you start just little things like that, okay? We're not talking about, you know, the gifts of the spirit per se, but we're talking about essential things. You begin to question that. And for, then you look at 1,500 years and say, well, I don't know about the way they interpreted it. You, you just open up the floodgates. But it's a slow, gradual, deadly descent. All right. Conversation. Because <laughs> the pooling of ignorance just feels better than hard truth. Okay, so we don't really... The emergent church is very much along the lines of there is no hard absolutes, and we're absolutely sure about that. All right, one more guy I'm going to mention here is Mark Driscoll. Anybody heard of him? Mark Driscoll, pastor, pastor in Seattle. All right, well, when the, emergent, the young emergent church, the leadership network, when they were getting together back in the 90s, Mark Driscoll was actually part of that group, friends with Tony Jones, Doug Padgett, all right? Mark Driscoll, over the past, I think, five years or so, has now come out of that and said, guys, this is, we're missing it. We, because I, I think there's some good things in it in the sense that we all want to reach our culture better for Jesus. We all want authenticity. We all want, you know, we want Jesus for real and we want real people, right? I mean, aren't we sick of hypocritical things in the church? We all would agree with that. But... Mark Driscoll began to realize that when you begin to, you know, doubt and question the word of God and question the atonement and question hell, uh, we're, we're going the wrong direction. So here's what he says. In the mid-1990s, I was part of what is known as the Emerging Church and spent some time traveling the country to speak on the Emerging Church and the Emerging Culture on a team put together by a leadership network called the Young Leaders Network. But I eventually had to distance myself from the emergent stream of the network because friends like as he was friends with um, Brian McLaren also, and Doug Padgett, began pushing a theological agenda that greatly troubled me. Examples include referring to God as a chick. Okay, the Rob Bell video, She. Anybody heard of that one? It's one of his newer ones. Okay, that's part of it. Referring to God as a chick. Questioning God's sovereignty over the knowledge of the future. Okay, anybody know what that is? Open theism. That's big in the emerging church. That means God doesn't know what's going to happen in the future. Does anybody believe that? Okay, but that's part of, that's when you buy into the emergent church, that's part of what you're buying into. Denial of the substitutionary atonement at the cross, cosmic child abuse, according to McLaren, which that's just so twisted. A low view of scripture, as we talked about, and denial of hell, in typical Mark Driscoll language, which is one hell of a mistake. Mark, Mark Driscoll is known as a cussing pastor. He needs to, he's still got a little bit of emergent, uh, uh, got a grip on him there. But again, he was in the midst of this thing. He was actually teaching on it. And he came to the point where he said, wait a minute, this is, we missed it, guys. So now he goes and he's speaking against it and writing books against it, trying to bring a balance. Yes, we need to reach the world, but we don't need to be like the world. We're God's people. We're sanctified and set apart for his service. We got Gumby. Text, wonderful, bendable, highly amusing toys. Okay, because again, when you have a low view of scripture, you can just kind of conform it to whatever you want it to be to make your argument. Why do we do that? Well, in the emergent Bible, we assert that dogma has led to some tragic events in history, such as the Salem witch trials, genocide occurring during the Crusades, the Spanish Inquisition, and many other unfortunate events. Okay, that's because we believed in dogma. I don't think so. Recognizing this, many emerging Christians reject such dogmatism, preferring liberty in scriptural interpretation on many issues deemed non-essential, such as hell, homosexuality, okay, those non-essential issues. Now, you begin to say that dogma, if you're going to say that because I believe that Jesus Christ is the only way, truth, and the life, that that is comparing me to the like Salem witch trials and Spanish. No. What were those things? That, that, was, that was heretical. That was, that was people that were doing things in the name of God without God. You know, twisting scripture. So to compare those things is a, is a huge leap. OK. 
Okay, maturity. Yeah, when I was like you, I never doubted the Bible either, but I outgrew that. Now, I've actually had people, because I have friends that have gotten involved in the emergent church. We've had long debates, okay? And I've actually had them tell me this. Yeah, I used to think like you. Yeah, I used to act like that. Yeah, I used to think that way too, but it's like, well, dude, what happened? You fell off the wagon. What do you mean you used to think like that? My, well, one, uh, one good friend of mine, matter of fact, when, uh, when Rob Bell, when those NUMA videos first started coming out, he would come over to my house. And before he'd come over, he'd call me up. He'd say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop by. And I've got the, the, these, these movies. You just got to see them. Okay. Yeah, there are these videos. And he's, you know, he's telling me all about it. I never heard of this stuff. So I'm like, okay, whatever. So he would come over and pop it in. And, you know, <laughs> we'd be watching it. He'd be like, you know, like right there, you know, next to me. And I'm like, Okay, and so we're watching the video, and we get done watching, and he so what'd you think? Um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was cool. I mean, there was nothing heretical. It was fun, but there's something about it. Like, man, what did, something is like, something about this is just rubbing me the wrong way, and I don't know what it is, okay? So he, he did that a couple times, you know. He'd bring them over, yeah, check this one out, you know, and pop it in, and we'd watch it, and what'd you think? Yeah. And then finally, after the third time, I said, you know what, dude, um, I don't know. I, 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 let me let me let me look into this a little bit. And I then I that's when I read Velvet Elvis, Rob Bell's first book, and uh, I went through that book. And actually, I don't think I even read the whole thing because I, it was it was laborsome. Um, has anybody read that book? Okay, there is just stuff littered through there about you know doubting the scripture. Um, uh, one, one example Rob Bell gives, he talks about a wedding, okay? He had a friend of his that wanted him to do a wedding, but the problem was his friend was an, was an atheist. So he says, well, will, will you do that wedding anyway, Rob? Because we really, you know, we like the way you talk and we like how you do things. Could you do my wedding? On one condition is what he is what was told to Rob Bell. He, he had to do the wedding on this one condition. He can't mention Jesus, God, or the Bible, but I want you to do my wedding. Okay, Rob Bell, now remember, we're talking about pastors here, guys. Um, how do I do a marriage without Jesus, God, or the Bible? I don't know how that works because what is the marriage? It's what? It's a, it symbolizes what? Our relationship to God, God's relationship. To, I mean, the, the whole thing is just steeped in Bible, okay? Now check this out. So Rob Bell does what? He says, okay, I'll do it. And in his book, he talks about how they were up on a mountaintop and he did the ceremony and whatever that meant. Um, did the whole thing. And then afterwards, he said it was the most wonderful spiritual experiences that he's ever had. Without Jesus, God, or the Bible, how does that work? You know, I just, that, was, that might have been one of the last pages I read in the book. Because I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. You cannot have a spiritual experience without Jesus, God, and the Bible. So let's look at how does the emergent church view the scriptures. And I've got some quotes on here. I don't believe I will ever walk away from God for an intellectual reason. Who knows anything anyway? So we really can't be too sure of anything that we read. Uh, Tomlinson, another leader, to say scripture is the word of God is to employ a metaphor. God cannot be thought of as literally speaking words since they are an entirely human phenomenon that could never prove it adequate as a medium for the speech of an infinite God. Hmm, so what do we do with, thus saith the Lord? And the Lord spoke all throughout the scripture. That one, in another sense, should kind of, it should give you some righteous anger saying that, you mean the God, basically saying God couldn't, couldn't really speak to us. Doesn't that, to me, it's, it gives me some kind of anger. Well, what do you mean? You're saying God can't talk to me? God can't communicate? To his, to his children? I, I find that really troublesome. Here's a quote by Rob Bell. This is out of uh, Velvet Elvis. Our words aren't absolutes. Only God is absolute. And God has no intention of sharing this absoluteness with anything, especially words people come up with to talk about him. He goes, uh, Doug Paget. I don't think you can explain how the Christian faith works either. It is a mystery. And I love this about the Christian spirituality. It cannot be explained. And yet it is a 
beautiful and true. It is something you feel and it comes from the soul.